Richard Dawkins, well-known atheist who wrote the book The God Delusion, and he's asked this question. Dr. Dawkins, the idea of evolution and natural selection makes some people feel that everything is meaningless, people's individual lives and life in general. And you know what his answer was? Well, if it's true and that causes people to feel despair, that's tough. If it's true, it's true and you better live with it. The universe doesn't owe us any meaning. It could be that there is no meaning of life. And if so, that would be just tough. But you see, when you start with the Bible, the Bible says something very, very different. See, the Bible claims to be, regardless of what anyone else says about it, it claims over 3,000 times to be the Word of God. Over the years, I found that many Christians can be easily intimidated by non-Christians in regard to their witnessing concerning the Christian faith. As a result, many Christians can be quite timid not really knowing what best to say. Well, in this session, I want to do something that's sort of radical for education. I want to teach you not just what to think, but how to think, how to think logically as a Christian, how to best logically argue the Christian faith with a non-Christian and therefore be able to answer those skeptical questions in a way that leaves a non-Christian not having an answer. When you understand this, you'll be much more bold in your witnessing and see people listen concerning the truth of God's word. For this session, I want to bring two verses of scripture together. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. It's so obvious from looking around us that there's a God, obvious from the creation that there's a God. But then there's this verse of scripture in Romans 10.17, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So it's obvious from the creation there's a God, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I want to bring those two together to help us understand how we need to be communicating the message of the gospel, message of Christianity uh, to our culture today. You know, the issue of origins is very different to talking about how to build a motor car or how to build a space shuttle, how to make a computer. The issue of origins is really an issue of history. And if you think about it, here we are in the present. We're in the present and we're trying to understand, well, hopefully we exist in the present. When I was a teacher, not all my students did exist in the present, but that's a whole other issue. Here we are existing in the present, and what we're trying to do is to understand what happened in the past to bring the present into being. You see, the, the, the problem we have, is like watching a Sherlock Holmes movie. I was watching this Sherlock Holmes movie. It was totally frustrating. I got so angry at the end. Because you see, you get halfway through, you know who done it, the butler done it. Three quarters of the way through, it's obvious the butler done it. Three minutes before the end, the butler definitely done it. Then two minutes before the end, Sherlock Holmes does something that is so annoying. He suddenly pulls out this one little piece of evidence that they didn't tell you through the whole movie. You realize it wasn't the butler that didn't after all, it was this other person. The movie ends and you say, it was a waste of time watching this. Do you feel like kicking the TV in the teeth? I mean, it's ridiculous. See, here's the problem we've got. No matter how much we know, there's an infinite amount more to know, which means no matter how much we know, we don't know how much more there is to know anyway, which means we don't know how much we do know or don't know in relation to whatever that is, uh, which we don't know, because we don't know how much more there is that we don't know, which means we just don't know much at all. That's, that's the bottom line. That, that's what it's all about. And you see, no matter how much we know compared to what God knows, do you realize we know next door to nothing? Ultimately, the only way you could ever be sure that you were going to come to the right conclusion about things in the past when you weren't there and you don't know everything is if someone who was there who knows everything, who doesn't tell a lie, who told us what happened, revealed to us the information we need to know. Oh, by the way, I happen to have a book that claims to be the word of one who knows everything, who's always been there, who doesn't tell a lie, who says, here's what happened so you can understand all you need to know to put it all together, know who you are, where you came from, what the universe is all about. You see, ultimately, there are only two ways of understanding reality. You either start with God's word, the word of one who knows everything, who has all information, who, who gives us the information we need, or somehow man has to figure it out. If you think about it from a perspective of the secularists who don't believe in, in God's word, here they are in the present, and they're trying to work from the present into the past to understand what happened in the past. You know, for the Christian, we've got a revelation from someone who says, here's what happened in the past, so we work from what happened in the past to the present. It's very different. And you see, 
When you think about it, the education system in America, the government education system, has thrown God out of that system. And so they teach something like this. For instance, the late Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is all there is, or ever was, or ever will be. In fact, they teach this history. There was a Big Bang 15 billion years ago, 10 billion years ago, the stars formed, 5 billion years ago, the sun, 4.5 billion years ago, a molten earth, 3.8 billion years ago, water cooled on the earth. By the way, they know all this from digital photographs. Oh, by the way, the fact that you laugh tells me you understand the issue. You know they weren't there. You know they don't have digital photographs of what happened in the past. That's the whole point. They weren't there. They didn't see that happen. You got the point. They believe that as water cooled on the earth, that eventually life formed. Nobody can explain how that happened, but they believe it did. A man in history called Charles Darwin looked at life on Earth and noticed that life changes. In fact, it does. Dogs change. They change into dogs. Pigeons change. They change into pigeons. Elephants change. They change into... See, you get it. You understand. Exactly. But he said, given enough time, the changes we see will add up to big changes to change one kind of animal into another. Supposedly, over millions of years, as life evolved... Death, bloodshed, disease, suffering is all a part of this process. Eventually, ape-like creatures turn into people. Supposedly, the record of the evolutionary history of life is left in the fossil record. For instance, at the Grand Canyon, you see those layers, one on top of the other. It's a record of death and struggle and suffering and thorns and diseases and animals eating each other. It's a horrible record. The secularists construct what they call a geological time scale based on the fossil layers we see around the earth and they have the oldest layers on the bottom and the youngest layers on the top. By the way, by and large, basically we agree. In most instances, the oldest layers are on the bottom and the youngest layers are on the top. But not younger by millions of years, younger by maybe a few months in most instances. And then they have a statement of purpose and meaning. Richard Dawkins, well-known atheist who wrote the book The God Delusion, he was being interviewed by BeliefNet and you can actually go and see the whole interview there. And he's asked this question, Dr. Dawkins, the idea of evolution and natural selection makes some people feel that everything is meaningless, people's individual lives and life in general. See, th he was asked this question because, you know, basically people say, now wait a minute, you're an atheist, you don't believe in God, that's right. When you die, you won't even know you ever existed, that's true. And when people who knew you die, they won't know that you existed and you won't know that they existed and none of you will know that anything ever happened, is that right? That's correct. And eventually the whole universe dies and no one will know anyone ever existed, is that right? That's correct. That's what it's all about. Then people will get the idea there's no purpose and meaning in life. And you know what his answer was? Well, if it's true and that causes people to feel despair, that's tough. If it's true, it's true and you better live with it. <laughs> what a wonderful message of hope for the world. You know what? There's no God. When you die, you won't even know you ever existed. Become an atheist. But you see, when you start with the Bible, the Bible says something very, very different. See, the Bible claims to be, regardless of what anyone else says about it, you know, you say, well, I don't believe the Bible. It claims over 3,000 times to be the Word of God. It claims it's the Word of God who knows everything, who's always been there, who revealed, has revealed to us what we need to know about who we are, where we came from. In fact, it gives us a very specific history. In fact, when you start with the Bible, it talks about the origin of time, the origin of space, the origin of the earth, the origin of water, the origin of dry land, the origin of plants. It's the origin of the sun, the origin of the moon, the origin of the stars, the origin of flying creatures, the origin of sea creatures, the origin of land creatures, the origin of man, the origin of woman, the origin of marriage, the origin of sin, the origin of death, the origin of nations, the origin of languages, the origin of clothing. Do you know any other book that does that? Not even an evolutionist book does all that. This book is very specific. In fact, if this book really is the word of God, the history is so specific, we should be able to test it. In fact, we summarize that history from Genesis to Revelation, the first book to the last book, as the seven seas of history. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, confusion, Christ, cross, consummation. Creation, the creation week. God made animals after their kind. And then God made uh, the first man from dust, the first woman from his side. By the way, we're all descendants of one man and one woman. That would mean there's only one race of people. Actually, when the Human Genome Project mapped the human genome, do you know what they said? We found there's only one race. Wow, who would have ever thought of that? <laughs> and then the Bible says the first man, Adam, sinned against God, rebelled against God. That's why death entered the world, that death is an enemy. That's why we die. 
The Bible also tells us there's been a global flood. If there was a global flood, you'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And you know what you find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. The Bible says after the flood that people congregated together again to worship the heavens instead of worshiping the God who made the heavens, instead of moving out over the earth. And so God gave them different languages as a result that families, according to their language, moved away from each other, the Bible says. They would have formed distinct cultures and people groups, which is exactly what we see today. And then the Bible tells us that the Son of God stepped into history to be a man, to be one of us, to be a descendant of Adam, of the human race, to, to be our relative but a perfect man to pay the penalty for our sin, to die on a cross because death was a penalty for sin, to be raised from the dead, offer a free gift of salvation to save us from, from what we did and separating ourselves from our creator. And one day there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth because this one's groaning because of the effects of sin. It's going to get back to what it used to be. In fact, as you have a look at those seven seas, it was a perfect creation. And one day in the future, it's going to be perfect once again. Sin entered the world and death is a result of sin. That's why Jesus Christ died on the cross and be raised from the dead. The flood of Noah's day was a judgment, but it's a wonderful message of salvation, an ark of salvation. People had to go through a doorway to be saved. Jesus Christ said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he'll be saved. The Tower of Babel reminds us we're all descendants of one man, Adam. There's only one race, and Jesus Christ became a member of the human race, which is why the gospel message is for all tribes and, and, and nations. And then there's a, a wonderful message of purpose and meaning. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Life. And you look at that and say, wow, that is so different to the other account of, of history. That's right. In fact, I have young people say to me, Mr. Ham, you've just given us two totally different accounts of history. That's right. Two totally different accounts. Big Bang, no Big Bang. Billions of years, thousands of years. Death has always been here. Death is an intrusion. It's an enemy. Man and woman from ape-like creatures, man from dust, woman from his side. No global flood, global flood. No purpose and meaning, purpose and meaning. They're totally different, aren't they? And so people say, how can you have two totally different accounts of the origin of the universe? Well, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, a creationist or an evolutionist, let me ask you a question. Do we all have the same fossils or different fossils? Do we all have the same animals, real animals, like a kangaroo? Do we all have the same animals or different animals? Same. Do we all observe the same rock layers and canyons? Yes, we do. Do we all have the same world? Well, it depends upon your perspective, but we all have the same world. Uh, that's true. Do we all observe the same dinosaur bones and so on, talk about the same dinosaurs? Yes, we do. Do we all observe the same animal death? Yes, we do. Do we all suffer the same human death? Yes, we do. Do you know what that means, by the way? Here's the point I want to get across to us. Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, a creationist or an evolutionist, actually, when it comes to talking about the issue of origins and history, we all have the same facts because we all have the same present world. It's not the facts that are any different. I have people come to me sometimes and they say, oh, I'm here because I want to hear all the facts that prove creation. Actually, I'm going to talk about the same facts an evolutionist does. What do you mean? We've all got the same facts. You see, there are people that say, well, wait a minute, an evolutionist has all these facts. If we're going to win, we've got to have more facts than them. And that's how some people look on it, that you know, we've got to get the most facts. Actually, when it comes to the issue of origins, we all exist in the present. We all have the same present world. The battle is really over the same facts. What's different is not the facts. What's different is not the evidence. What's different is how you interpret that evidence in the context of history. And how you do that depends upon your starting point. There are ultimately only two starting points. You either start with God's word or you start with man's word. And on the basis of those two starting points, we build a worldview. We put on a set of glasses. We look at the world in the present on the basis of our starting point and we look at that evidence and we interpret it in accord with our starting point. For instance, when we look at DNA, that molecule of heredity, we find that DNA is actually a language system and an information system, and languages only come from an intelligence. Information only comes from information. DNA cries out, in the beginning, God, not in the beginning, hydrogen. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? Oh, I'm glad you're so excited. Maybe you should try that again. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? Now, when you start... From God's word, it says God made kinds after their kind. On the basis of man's ideas, one kind changed into another. Actually, as you examine genetics in dogs, and we'll do that when we talk about the race issue, we'll give a little course on genetics in that particular session and help us understand that actually you can have great changes within a kind 
A kind is more at a family level of classification, phylum class order, family, genus, species, but that one kind doesn't change into another. It actually confirms the Bible. When it comes to looking at the human race, even the Human Genome Project said there's only one race, which fits exactly with what the Bible said. Not what Charles Darwin popularized, different races. And the more you look at canyons and rock layers and fossils, the more you see evidence consistent with catastrophism, not slow processes over millions of years. When you come to the Creation Museum, one of the first exhibits we take you through is called the Dig Site, and we want to teach you to understand how scientists interpret evidence in relation to the past. So let me show you the short video that helps people uh, understand this. I grew up fascinated by dinosaurs, watching movies, collecting models, reading all about them. Dinosaurs were big. They were magnificent. They were awesome. I was taught that dinosaurs once ruled the world, but that millions of years ago, they disappeared from the Earth. Everything I believed about the age of the Earth, the cycles of life and death, the evolution of humankind began dinosaurs, and then I learned that the Bible presented a very different history. Kim here is my colleague, fellow paleontologist. We've been friends since college. Today we study the same fossils, we use the same techniques, but that doesn't mean we agree on what happened here. We do interpret our findings differently. You see, fossils don't come with tags on them telling us how old they are, where they lived, what they ate, or even how they died. We have to figure that out from the clues that we find. We never have enough clues. So, our starting points usually lead us to different conclusions. Well, here's how I see it. I think this dinosaur died over 100 million years ago. It dried out in the sun for a long time. Um, and later, I think the specimen was uh, covered by river sediment which was caused by a local flood. She's been lying here all this time till we dug her up. Where Kim sees millions of years, I see evidence of a different history. I believe this animal died in a flood, but it wasn't a local flood. It was a massive flood that covered the earth, Noah's flood, when God judged the world. The carcass was buried suddenly, before it could be eaten or decomposed, buried in a layer of sediment that stretches across the entire continent. Since the flood, according to the Bible, was about 4,300 years ago, that's how old I believe this fossil to be. We come to different conclusions because of our different starting points. I start with the Bible, my colleague does not. We all have the same facts. We merely interpret the facts differently because of our different starting points. And so you see, it really comes down to different starting points that cause you to interpret the same evidence differently. Now I have people say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. But doesn't science show that the Bible is not correct? Doesn't science uh, actually prove evolution? And I, I have even Christians who say, oh, I don't believe in science. I believe in the Bible. And others say, well, in the battle of the Bible versus science, can I ask you not to say that it's Bible versus science? Because it's not. See, first of all, if I asked you the question, what is science? What will we say? You know, I. I would say if you had 100 people in the audience and said, could you define what you would understand by science, you'd probably get 100 different definitions. But what does the word science mean? If you look up the dictionary definition of science, it means state of knowing, knowledge, having knowledge. Science really means knowledge. You know in the Bible where we read that verse, science falsely so called, it's, it's, it's knowledge falsely so called. You know what's not taught in our education system? The difference between knowledge gained through observation that builds our technology, observational, operational science, and historical science, which is really history, your beliefs concerning the past when you weren't there. So let me show you the short video that helps people uh, understand this. Have you ever heard this? Billions of years ago, there was an explosion in space, or 100,000 years ago, this happened, or that happened, or even in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Question. How does anyone know? 
I mean, was anybody there to observe it? Well, actually somebody was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Check this out. First of all, we need to recognize that there is a huge difference between observational science and historical science. Both are valuable, but very different. Let's define the two real quick, shall we? Observational science is simply when we observe something and experiment to draw conclusions. It involves repeatable experimentation and observations in the present. It's through observational science that we find cures for diseases and build space shuttles, stuff like that. Now, through historical science, we consider things that happened in the past, but they cannot be checked in the same way. I mean, we don't have access to the past like we do the present because, well, it's gone, right? All we really have is speculation, or at best, circumstantial evidences of past events based on what we see in the present. That's not to say that we can't make intelligent guesses about the past or form reasonable inferences from rocks or fossils in the present, but we certainly cannot directly test our conclusions because we cannot repeat the past. Got it? So, does that mean historical science is unimportant? Not at all. Let's drop an example down here for a minute and take a look at the Eiffel Tower. You know, that 19th century Parisian monument designed by Gustave Eiffel that stands 1,063 feet tall, which was built as the entrance for the 1889 World's Fair and is still the tallest building in Paris today visited by millions of people each year? Yeah, that one. Well, guess what? Everything I just told you is true, but how do we test it? Well, applying observational science, we can, of course, observe the Eiffel Tower anytime we're in Paris. It's here in the present. Then, we can continue by testing the height and comparing it to all the other structures in Paris and confirm the claim that it is indeed the tallest building in Paris. But that's the extent of the kind of facts that can be proved by observational science in reference to this claim. How do we really know that Gustav designed it? How do we really know it was built in the 19th century as an entrance to the 1889 World's Fair? How do we really know how many people visited? That's all in the past. It can't be repeated. For that kind of information, we need to go outside the limits of observational science and discover what has been communicated to us through historical documents and eyewitness accounts. And furthermore, we have to believe those eyewitnesses and documents are trustworthy. The same is true when we talk about the origin of the Earth. The Earth is here. We all agree with that. So, does observational science confirm that the world was created by God, and are there trustworthy documents and eyewitness accounts that confirm it? Well, let's take the last part first. In short, what we're really asking is my original question, was anybody there to observe it? The answer is yes. God was there, and he told us how he created. He inspired people to write down his very words that became books that were compiled into a complete book called the Bible, which has been verified over and over again and has demonstrated itself to be totally trustworthy in all it claims and teaches. Even secular scholars will concede that the Bible accurately records historical events. Anyway, we have the most trustworthy revelation from the most trustworthy eyewitness. Now, what about observational science? Does it confirm the Bible? Yes. And what's extremely important to realize is the observable fact that the universe is logical and orderly. That makes sense only if its creator is logical and has imposed order on his creation. It doesn't make sense at all if the universe is just an accident of a huge explosion. Also, our minds are able to comprehend many things about the universe, and that's only possible if the creator of the mind gave us the ability and desire to explore the universe. It doesn't make sense if our brains are byproducts of chance because we couldn't trust their conclusions to ever be accurate. And lastly, it only makes sense that we can observe and repeat an experiment if the universe consistently obeys the same laws from day to day, which only makes sense if a lawgiver created it that way and upholds it. So to be bluntly honest, science itself, whether observational or historical, is only possible because God exists and the Bible is true. I could go on, but enough said. There are evolutionists who do some great science in the sense of observational science. Because, you see, they have the same science we do. That's why I met an evolutionist and a creationist years ago at the Goddard Space Center, both working on the Hubble telescope, and they agreed on how to build the Hubble telescope. But what they disagreed on was the origin of the universe. See, that's a very different matter. That's what we need to understand. And, you know, when it comes to origins, what we want to know is knowledge. We want to have knowledge, but we need all knowledge to make sure we got it right, which means we need someone who is omniscient. Oh, I know someone who is. We have a book that claims to be a revelation from God. And, in fact, when you look at that history, it makes sense of the world. Oh, that's why there are fossils over the world. That's why we die. Oh, that's why there's only one race of human beings. Ah, oh, so, so now I understand. That's why dogs always reproduce dogs. Yes, it makes sense. The Bible's history makes sense of the world. And you see, here's the point. Here's how we can decide whose starting point is right in that sense. Now, we would say as Christians that... It's actually illogical not to start with the Bible. You have to start with the Bible. I mean, why do we have the laws of nature? If it's a random universe, why do we have the laws of nature? 
If it's a random universe, why do we have the laws of logic? You know, I had a young man once who came to me and he said, oh, sir, I went to your seminar, but you know what? He said, I still believe in the Big Bang. I believe we're the result of chance random processes. Really, son? Yes, sir. I said, well, if you're the result of chance random processes, your brain is a result of chance random processes. Is that right? Well, yes, sir. If your brain's a result of chance random processes, your processes of logic are the result of chance random processes. Is that right, son? I guess so, sir. Well, if your logic is a result of chance random processes, you don't know your logic evolved the right way. Son, you're not even sure if you're asking me the right question. To which he said, what was that book you recommended? Because <laughs> he started to understand. It's actually illogical not to start with the Bible. Actually, uh, the only thing that makes sense of the universe is the biblical God. In fact, really, non-Christians have to borrow from biblical presuppositions to even do their research, even if they don't admit it, because when they agree with the laws of logic and the laws of nature, they're actually saying there's a God, the God of the Bible.